Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Innovation Conversation. Today we are joined by Callum Woodcock from WineFind. Callum, welcome. Thank you, Ricardo. It's a, a pleasure to be here. Oh, it's a pleasure having you here. So tell us all about WineFi. I'm quite curious about it. I'm a big wine fan, a wine fan myself. So uh, what does your platform do? Yeah, um, great question. So WineFi is a next generation platform specifically for investing in fine wine. The idea being that you as an individual can create a basket of wines that we manage for you from sourcing all the way through to sale or intermediary platforms or institutional investors can create managed portfolios through us. Uh, we have an expert investment committee that chooses the assets, which includes two professional wine investors and two masters of wine. Mm -hmm. And the basic idea behind the platform is that we take what has been previously a very opaque, complicated uh, experience and really make it as, as easy as placing a trade on Robinhood or eToro to use an imperfect mm -hmm. uh, analogy. Interesting. So how... How does it actually work? So I know that, for example, when you're buying a stock, it's 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 highly regulated. Um, how does this compare to buying a stock? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think there are some similarities between fine wine and stocks. Um, you know, in the simple sense that when you're you know investing in an actively managed fund, or if you're choosing your own portfolio from stocks, you're looking at various different factors. So. You know, for equities, it might be something like um, the leadership team that's in place, how they're performing, their revenue targets, whether they're in a sector that's growing. And for wine, it's very similar, apart from you're looking at factors that relate to the producer, the vintage. Uh, the price is, is very important because you can buy very overpriced assets that aren't going to appreciate much, or you can buy assets that have been misvalued by the market. Um, and then just in terms of you know, how you would go about buying them, there are some differences in that there are channels open to the wine trade and trade buyers that aren't open to individual investors. And I think this is what has historically led to the disconnect between individuals who are looking to invest in wine and uh, you know, the, the kind of wine merchants, wine brokers who have a real informational asymmetry because they can understand what the market, what the, the market is for that particular wine in a much deeper and more accurate way than the individual investor can. And the other thing, you mentioned equities being heavily regulated. Wine in and of itself is not a regulated asset. When you put it in certain vehicles, that starts to become a, a regulated activity. So it starts to look like a collective investment scheme if you're pooling investor funds or you're creating a you know, bona fide wine, wine fund. But wine in and of itself is not regulated. And I'm afraid to say that it's attracted you know, a few perhaps shadier players to the market over the years. Interesting. And how, how is this wine uh, kept? Is it still in the barrels or, or bottles? How does, how does that work? Sure. So it varies, but typically the assets that we will be buying are what's called in bond. So in bond just means stored in a UK government bonded warehouse. The UK for strange historic regions, uh, reasons is the center of the global wine trade, mainly because wine from you know, France, Italy, Germany, Spain, etc., would flow oh, into the UK Portugal, before. Right? That's, that's, that's... Or, or, or Portugal. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned Portugal there in that, that whole story. Exactly. We can't, we can't <laughs> neglect Portuguese wine. Yeah. Um, uh, but yes, yeah, so historically, that wine would flow into the UK prior to flowing out to the US and yeah. overseas. Uh, so the UK has this fantastic system of bonded warehouses. Now, the reason that you have to store the wine in bond as as it goes and the reason that we will only purchase wine either direct from producer or that is that has been stored in bond is kind of threefold so firstly vat and duty is considered expen um, suspended until those assets leave bond they're almost like free ports in and yep. of themselves so you can import the wine from france or italy or wherever you're reporting it from without paying the, the lovely import duties that we have since um that we have you know given ourselves by leaving the european union um and uh, secondly, because these warehouses are specifically designed to keep the assets in perfect condition. So you have examples like London City Bond or Wiltshire or Coterie Vaults, uh, which are all warehouses where temperature, light, humidity and vibration are carefully controlled. So the wine, a future buyer knows that that wine has been kept in, in perfect condition. Uh, taking wine out of bond is a bit like buying a, an action figure and uh, taking it out of the, 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 the package and then trying to resell it on. 
um, but for you know adult wine drinkers. Uh, and then the final reason that you have to buy in bond is the moment that wine leaves the warehouse, it effectively disappears from the view of the market, which is where there is no longer a, a comparison with equities or publicly traded equities at least. So what does that mean? Well, firstly, no one knows how it's been stored. So you don't know whether you're buying wine that's in, in great physical condition or that has been in someone's kitchen cupboard for a few years, you yeah. know, just at completely the wrong temperature. But the other problem is, of course, wine forgery. And I think people often underestimate how much of a problem this is in a market like the fine wine space. And like any luxury goods, so, you know, uh, uh, fake watches, for example, there is a whole industry built around counterfeit uh, assets. And by some estimates, around 20% of wine in circulation on the open market, so not stored in bond, uh, in circulation on the open market, is fake. So there's a great Netflix documentary that your listeners may have seen or be interested in watching called Sour Grapes, which explores this in detail. Um, but it's a major issue. So when you buy wine in bond, you know typically that it has perfect provenance. So it's gone straight from the producer into bond, and then it's moved around or changed hands multiple times within bond. It's a wordy explanation, uh, but I hope that made sense. No, it makes sense because there, there's a lot of fake goods that we keep on buying without even realizing. You mentioned mine, but also olive oil is quite um, quite in the news nowadays because there's been a lack of production. Honey is the same thing. We're actually buying honey. I think the biggest exporter of honey is Singapore, if I'm not mistaken. Reason being is that everyone from China just produces honey made out of rice and then puts it in Singapore, and then Singapore has this ridiculous amount of exports. But actually, it doesn't make any sense because they don't have that many bees. So yeah, it's, it's a big that, issue. That, that's one of the most interesting, but perhaps niche facts I think I've ever heard on a podcast. So oh, thank sorry you about that. <laughs> no, I, I, no, I'll remember. I'll remember that. Thank yeah. you. But you, you're saying about, about the wine and, and how, so everything is controlled. So we actually know the wine came from the producer. We know it has been kept in perfect storage conditions. And we know that it should, in theory, you know, hold on to its value for a long, long time. It's exactly that. And I think a lot of people, because, you know, wine is a, a passion asset like watch collecting or art collecting or classic car collecting. And I think a lot of people conflate collecting, which is for pleasure, with investing, which is ultimately for anticipated financial gain. And the clear distinction between the two, in my mind, is whether or not you're storing them in bond or you're storing them somewhere you can display them at home and, you know, talk about them yeah. and give them to friends yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And how yeah. um, does the wine, so obviously wine, um, there's different types of wines and all these uh, wines have different maturity. So some are to be consumed within, I don't know, five years. Others can actually last for a lifetime and then more. The, does the wine as an asset mature by a certain date? Like you buy, uh, you know, I don't know, a wine and then you expect it to sell within five years. How, how does that work? Yeah. So a lot of it has to do with the type of wine. Um you know, red wine, for example, would typically last longer than white wine. Fortified wines would typically last longer than the than normal red wine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when, what you need to look at really is, is the wine's drinking window. Now, this is often an estimate provided by a professional wine critic. And the trick when it comes to wine investment is to buy the wines um, relatively early into their drinking windows or uh, relatively young wines that have not yet entered their drinking windows and hold them for as long as you can within reason, because eventually those wines will hit peak maturity. They will be very attractive to someone who wants to purchase them in order to drink them because they will be at their very best. And at the same time, the number of that wine and that vintage on the market will have declined quite substantially. So we're talking about, um, you know, producers, so the, the vineyards or the chateaus themselves, who have a limited supply of in every vintage anyway. So let's say, um, you know, Chateau Aubryon with, with 12,000 cases in a vintage, for example. Over time, some people won't wait for them to enter their drinking window, so they'll be, they'll be, they'll be consumed young, but yeah. also bottles are you know, damaged, they are improperly stored, um, they are consumed once they reach their drinking window. So the longer that you hold the assets, the fewer of them exist, um, or the, you know, less, less of them exist on the market, basically. So yeah. that's the basic idea behind behind wine investing. So you really want to hold as an investor as long as you can into that drinking window up into yeah. the, the demand curve. And can you sell that as, as an asset to, let's say you need to liquidate some of the assets. Is that possible? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, we trade cases of wine all of the time. Um, it's a relatively illiquid market, but it's not as illiquid as, for example, the market for companies or even for property in some cases. 
So uh, it is possible to to sell um, wines uh, on the open market, um, either to private buyers, to merchants, um, to hospitality venues, whoever it might be. Uh, but if you want to get the best possible price, then you don't want to have an incentivized sale. So you don't want to sell you know, overnight if you can avoid it, because someone will say, OK, yeah, sure, I'll take those assets from you, but you're going to pay a discount. Uh, so you want to broker them slowly into the market. How, Callum, how did you get started in all this? So, how, I mean, because you're still a startup, uh, but at the same time, you're quite a mature company. So how did this idea come about? Sure. I think we, we're still firmly a startup, but I think we're mature in a lot of our processes and in our selection criteria, um, mainly thanks to the strength of our investment committee and the people that we have involved. But yeah, from my perspective, I started my career in asset management. So I worked first at Fidelity and then at JP Morgan. So I always had this nerdy interest in investing. Um, but at the same time, my fiance's family are deep in the wine trade. Her father was um, uh, at one point overseeing a, a major UK importer. He then went on to become the CEO of a uh, an English sparkling wine company and was always aware as a result of wine as a collectible, but also as an investment. And I found the latter really fascinating. And I'm ashamed to say it's where I started my my journey into wine, really. I started looking at it as an asset versus a consumable, which upsets everybody in the trade <laughs> and uh, and and who, who sees themselves as a connoisseur, as you can imagine. Um, I'll caveat this by saying I have since gone on to you know, become very yes, passionate about the underlying. Disclaimer, 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 et cetera. Um, but Fine Wine basically has this incredible investment profile where um, the two you know, mainstream wine indices, for example, which are produced by this fantastic company called the Livex, uh, who have done a lot to to professionalize the space, have, um, you know, broadly outperformed most mainstream equity indices. Over a long time horizon, it performs similarly to the, the S&P. Mm -hmm. um, and it is uncorrelated to other assets. So it shows no correlation to, to traditional equities, but very little correlation to commodities or bonds, etc. So it's a really interesting diversifier. And at the same time, because as we've already discussed, it's illiquid, uh, it's also very uh, unvolatile. So it behaves, it's a risky risk saying this, but it, it behaves, it has a stability a lot like government bonds. Um, and it's a safe haven asset, so, so it behaves a bit like gold in that sense. And in certain jurisdictions, under certain circumstances, it's also exempt from capital gains tax. So I was aware that wine had this fascinating investment profile. And I found that my own experience trying to invest in wine, you know, when I first had a little bit of money to, to allocate, was very substandard versus what I'd seen from professional asset managers, like not just JP Morgan, but also their clients. So I was selling to intermediaries and distribution partners. And I thought, you know, it's such an interesting asset class. There's a real opportunity here to bring this asset class mainstream. And then the more that I spoke to my client base at JP Morgan, you know, after I'd, after I'd left, I went to work at an early stage startup. Uh, the more I realized that there was interest from this really broad audience of sophisticated investors in structured wine investment products. So not just owning the wines outright themselves, but also investing in, you know, closed ended vehicles with a certain time horizon. So we hold the wine for five years or whatever. Um, and I think that's really exciting because it represents a huge opportunity, not just for investors to gain access to to wine through a reputable company that is adhering to you know the highest possible standards in asset management but i think it represents an incredible opportunity for everyone connected to the wine ecosystem whether that's the wine trade you know the wine merchants storage companies but also the producers because it brings this new audience of people who have first discovered wine as an investment and then may well go on to become interested in the underlying assets as a consumable in the similar way that you might invest in an art fund and then think, oh, okay, I'm holding, you know, two percent of an Andy Warhol painting. You know, I, I'm I'm going to get a reproduction of this painting or whatever. Or I'm going to learn more about the artist. You know, it's that kind of journey. Um, so my hope is that Winefy's presence in the market will benefit everyone. And I think we've been very lucky that that seems to be how the market regards us so far. Is there a difference? Because I, you know, I, coming from Portugal, we. I tend to know a thing or two about corks, right? I actually went to the cork museum. I know exactly what a good cork looks like, what a bad cork looks like. But I also know how impactful that is into actually the storage of wine and making sure the wine doesn't turn into vinegar. So yeah. when the producers are producing this, this wine and it goes in, into bonds and storage and, and it becomes an investment vehicle, do mm. you have them change the, some of the elements of the actual like 
physical bottle or something like that, or it's just a very straightforward bottle that actually anyone can buy, but that just so happens to go into storage. Sure. So um, the the bottle won't change um, unless there is something wrong with the wine itself. People take it very seriously. They often get sent back to the producer for recorking, um, you know, especially for old and rare wines. Typically, the wines that we're investing in um, are not, you, you know, these ancient wines that have been improperly stored um, that need that kind of attention. But in the event, for example, an original wooden case was slightly damaged, that is the kind of thing that would be repaired. Yes. Interesting. And yeah. okay, this is because <laughs> this the wine is such a fascinating topic. Um, mm. But in terms of your 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 business and your idea. Did you get any external funding? Was it hard to get it off the ground? How did you just put all your money into it? How, how did it come about? <laughs> the money was already in wine. Uh, no, so um, was it hard? To, I, we did raise funding. So we, we've, we raised a pre-seed round that we wrapped up in October last year. Um, so we raised just under half a million. Uh, we were very lucky to get both funds and a bunch of really, really uh, interesting and useful, uh, knowledgeable angel investors on board. I'm giving them way too many compliments because they're probably listening to this podcast. But um, uh, we raised through SFC Capital, Founders Capital, and uh, then we had a number of angels as well, including some quite high profile figures like the incoming chairman of Inch Cape. Um, and really interestingly, figures from across the wine trade, which is great because it shows that there's a degree of interest from the trade, but also from the finance world. So we had, I think, VPs from Fidelity, BlackRock, JP Morgan. Oh, wow. um, T. Rowe Price uh, and a hedge fund as well who all participated because they wanted access to the asset class in a structured vehicle. And some of those have gone on to become our early, our early customers, our early investors, um, because they saw us as solving a problem that they knew existed for themselves, which is kind of the, the best way of raising. And if I'm being very cynical, um, you know, we raised at the worst time of year. I was fundraising in August. Um, in 2023 so during the summer of the worst in, in year August, for, that is yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> a lot of out of offices um but no i i think i was i was quite lucky if i'm being cynical that um rich people like wine so it's something that appeals to <laughs> ancient yeah. investors because they have an, an existing interest in the space mm -hmm. but yeah. so what's the plan for for your company i mean um, you told me that the uk is where you want to operate is there any other geography you can operate out of that has the same conditions or the plan is just you know let's concentrate everything in uk and work from here because there's actually quite a lot of protection and there is an ecosystem that supports what we're doing yeah that's a great question um i think in terms of where the assets are stored it has to be the uk assets um you know the the, the wine ideally you don't move it too much we do import from the us so from napa because we see that as an investment grade region but uh, increasingly through a new storage partnership, we, we are going to be storing in the US as well. Mm -hmm. I think initially um, we are focused on the UK, but we already have European clients. We're partnering with European distribution partners and a, um, a platform in Singapore that wants to offer wine as a, you know, a number of, a bar, as a basket of alternative assets to its customers. Mm -hmm. um, so we are almost global from day one, but what I want to make sure that we do is centralize our operations in the UK. Um, and it's, it's very interesting because when we're looking at expanding to the United States or to Australia or, or to mainland Europe, when you're looking at a concept like this, you know, so much innovation comes out of the US, but I think because of the central role that the UK still plays in that glo global landscape, that for this concept to take off, it has to be done by a UK business as opposed to an American business, which is an interesting moat because they're almost too far down the supply chain in some circumstances. Um, I think so, I think it makes sense because, yeah. I mean, wine purists can be a bit, um, how should I put this? Um, they can stick to their colors, right? Especially when you're comparing European wines with American wines. That's the whole, <laughs> there's a big, yeah. uh, big fight there saying, oh, they shouldn't even exist. But in reality, they actually have quite a lot of decent wines. So. Yeah, exactly. No, well, the yeah, the Americans produce fantastic wines. Um, you know, uh, Napa Valley is extraordinary. Uh, your listeners might be familiar with the Judgment of Paris, which was basically a blind tasting between uh, American and French uh, wine. Was it 72 or where the hell? Yeah, was? something. Yeah, it was it, it was nineteen seventies. Um, there's, there's the movie about it. Uh, trying to remember the actor, but it's actually on Amazon right now in the UK. You can actually watch that. It's a really good movie. 
Oh, nice. Well, shout out. There, there you go. Um, it's uh, Chris Pine, the guy from Star Trek, is actually there because he plays a role there. So it's a great movie. Yeah, yeah that's it. Um, but just for your listeners' benefit, if they're not familiar with the with the story, so uh, wine connoisseurs, shall we say? We, we won't call them snobs. Um, are typically very attached to old world wines. There's a lot of history and a lot of um, allure of, of old world, you know, fr- the classic French wines, the classic Italian wines with, with these lengthy histories behind them. Um, and yet there is a fantastic culture of innovation and winemaking, uh, not just in the US, but, you know, Australia, New Zealand, Chile, Argentina, South Africa. And, uh, you know, Napa Valley wines uh, really exploded onto the scene uh, because of this blind tasting that was set up by um, a, a chap called Stephen Spurrier, who basically took a bunch of Napa Cabernet Sauvignons and a bunch of top French Cabernet Sauvignons and put them side by side in uh, a blind tasting and then a tasting where the where the, um, uh, the the wine critics knew what they were tasting. And interestingly, in the blind tasting, the US wines wiped the floor with the French wines and the other way around was true when they knew what they were tasting. Mm-hmm. And because of the, you know, the, the objectivity of a blind tasting, it really put Napa Valley wines on the map. So it's a, yeah, it's a great story. And uh, yeah, as you say, the film, I can't remember what the film is called now, is it? Uh, I don't um, remember the name, but, but I remember the story so well from you because it's a really funny story when you put it in film, right? So people just go uh, naturally attracted to it. It's a bit like the whole Coca-Cola and Pepsi test that they did, I think, in the 80s. Right, the yes, principle, the same principle, blind testing, two two glasses, one's Coke, the other one's Pepsi. And I think everyone kind of went for the Pepsi. Yes. Oh, here you go. The, the choice of a new generation. That, that's it, Pepsi. Um, yeah. so it but it but it goes to show, it goes to show the um because the, the the later part of that story with Coke and Pepsi is that Pepsi I'm sorry, Coke changed their recipe to be sweeter and more Pepsi like. And people hated it because they as they were buying Coke for the brand. Um, as opposed to just for the taste, which goes to show the power of branding. So it kind of tells both sides of that story, like yeah. in, a, in a very elegant way. It's, it's funny because we're talking about wine and, and all that, but for example, champagne. Champagne can only be called champagne if it comes from champagne in France. However, you can get very, very good sparkling wine from everywhere in the world. It actually tastes just as good or even better sometimes. But you yeah. know, cannot call it champagne. Yeah, um, and that's and and that's you know that's a um, a major factor because it's about preserving the the quality as well and preventing someone from sneaking in under the radar with a, a bad quality wine and trying to pass it off as champagne. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, English sparkling wine doesn't quite roll off the tongue like champagne does, I suppose. No, and then it, it's gonna, you. I think you're going to struggle to try and sell uh, any sparkling wine from from England to anyone in France. It's yeah, just, you, you, you almost certainly would struggle to sell it to the French. Really However, is. I have to say, and I have to say this because my father-in-law yeah, mm-hmm. runs a uh, runs a uh, an English sparkling wine company. Uh, no, it's um, uh, it's a really interesting industry in the UK because one, the quality is excellent, so there's a lot of really premium sparkling wines coming out. But also because of climate change, mm-hmm. you know, the yeah. the temperature is moving north, so the south coast of England, so Sussex, for example, where a lot of these English sparkling wine the vineyards are, are located are you know basically where champagne was 10 15 20 years ago yes. and it will be interesting to see the impact that climate change has on um, not just you know the wine wine producers but also on you know investment grade wine in general because you'd think if there was ever to be a, a significant climate shift uh, then certain wines will be prized you know above others from certain producers because they were from you know, a better time. And that's basically how vintages work anyway. So mm-hmm. yeah, food for thought. It's, it, no, it's, it's quite interesting because I don't, I don't know how many, how many, how much people know about this, but climate greatly influences wine. It's not just about mm. the soil or the type of grape. It's also about the climate and the region you're growing the wine in. Um, so when that changes, things dramatically change, right? And it's, it's mm. so fun to think about it that way because I think we're going to end up with a lot of regions that we don't think necessarily produce good wine right now producing amazing wines in the future. And then the ones that were traditionally produced really, really good wine are just going to have either a drop in production or they need to change the grape types or something just to make sure the quality is as high as before. Yeah, I think you're completely right. And the other interesting factor then that comes into it, as we've already touched on, is is brand. So Chilean wine, for example, is fantastic. But if you walk into a supermarket, it will be typically priced right at the lower end of any wines available because in the minds of consumers it's a lower quality wine Mm -hmm. whether or not that's the case it's a matter of branding and having to invest in those brands 
uh, in order to build up that reputation. And, you know, top French wines, you know, the Bordeaux First Growths have this history going back hundreds of years. They have their own classification from 1855 uh, from a French emperor. You know, it's, um, it, it's, it's difficult to catch up with that sort of head start. So it'll be interesting to, seeing, to see how other producers um, approach it. It's, it's a fascinating marketing because anything related to alcohol, and especially like this type of complicated alcohol production, it's a lot of the branding that's evolved and a lot mm. of the history. But in reality, when you start tasting it blindly, you probably will prefer something new instead of the old ones, right? It does mm. happen quite often. Um, in terms of like the, the business side of things. Yeah, sorry, we got carried <laughs> away there. Because <laughs> no, I could talk about this, you know, like for hours. Uh, what was the worst day you had in your company? So the worst day, the worst day, the worst day. And the reason I'm asking this question is for people listening in, I mean, it's great because you have a background in finance, so you're coming to this new world, but you knew exactly what you're doing in terms of how to make your company attractive. But what was that, that day you just said, you know, I, I might actually quit. Yeah, um, sure. Everything went kind of tits up. Can I say tits up on a podcast? Probably. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, so in all honesty there, I don't think there's ever been a day where I've, thought about quitting um but there have been many very rough days as you can imagine i think you know it's it's part and parcel of building a startup in some ways especially an early stage startup i um listen i was listening to an alex hormozy podcast uh the other day and either he or his guest compared building a startup to being like constantly punched in the face and i thought yes that's like the exact analogy um i think in terms of the, the lowest point, it was actually probably during the fundraising process. So once we launched, we started seeing traction and revenue straight away, which was great, even before our platform was in private beta. So literally we, we were holding the assets, keeping our, our clients updated via email, you know, very low tech way of doing it. We now have a nice shiny platform that we're, mm -hmm. that we're iterating on. But I'd got halfway through this funding round and I'd raised through ASAs. I knew how much we needed to raise in order to hit certain targets. So an ASA uh, is just the, the, the catch-all term for like the Y Combinator safe. So basically you get paid um, by the investor in the business uh, in advance of a priced round. You know, so, so you, you've, taken, you've taken investment on board, but the valuation, et cetera, isn't, isn't decided. So I had basically raised about half of the money that I needed to... Um, to, to, to start the company and to make the hires that I wanted to hire and, and you know, hit the targets that I wanted to hit. And I had had a quite a lucky time, I think, at the beginning, a lot of investors had come on board um, because they liked the idea. You know, I'd, I bought a, a, a semi-fund on board, I bought a, a load of angels on board and I was like, oh, great. And I was kind of betting the second half of this round on this one investor. And if I'm totally honest, I think I'd slightly slacked off the fundraising as a result, you know, things were looking really positive and they decided not to move ahead or they weren't able to move ahead in the timeframes that I wanted them to. And that slightly left me in the lurch because I, I basically thought I've wasted two weeks or whatever going through this process when I could have set up a load of conversations with angels who might have been investing smaller amounts, but it would have made up that shortfall. Yeah. And then the concerning bit where I was thinking, oh, how am I going to turn this back around is... Uh, I, I was going full time. I'd already handed in my notice and I was thinking, okay, you know, we're going to have to, you know, wrap this round up really quickly. Um, and we were lucky that uh, a, a lot of our angels knew people uh, who, who were keen to invest and uh, we had some great people on board and we ended up closing the, you know, the, the exact amount that we wanted to raise, which was a relief. But because it was my first time raising, yep. you know, this is maybe a, a bit too transparent, but I was sitting there going, you know, okay, what now? And, you know, it's something that I, I, I've now got such distance on. So I can look at myself there and I was like, well, it's obvious, you know, that if, if X number of people were going to invest in you, then you're going to be able to close X remaining number of people in the same way that if you can get your first five customers, you can get your next five, you know, it's that kind of way of thinking. But at the time, I, I remember thinking that, that it was a, a major hurdle to get over as a business. Okay, so the question then is, or becomes, what advice would you give to someone just about to start their fundraising journey? So I think, okay, actually there's a, a few, that's a really good question. There, there were a few things that everyone told me and I had slightly ignored at the beginning because you know you, you have to go through the pain of, of making your own mistakes. Yeah. 
Um, the first thing is uh, make sure that the deck that you've got is really clear and tells an interesting story. That seems really obvious, but uh, you know, I see a number of bad decks myself. Um, somewhere I, I finish it and I can't work out what the concept really is, or I can't understand the revenue opportunity, you know, all of yeah. those kind of things. And I think that that needs to be really clear. And throughout the fundraising process, you know, we had about 24 iterations of our pitch deck because we were really trying to, yeah. uh, you know, r really convey that. And then you have a call with an investor or you get some feedback and they say, well, I didn't understand this or I'm passing for this reason or I liked it for this reason. And you go back and you change the deck a bit to really lean into that comment. Um, so I think that's I think that's important. Be clear on your idea um, and then you know be clearly able to convey it. I think the second thing is making sure that you do market research in advance. Um, we, I actually think we did do that very well. So we spoke to a lot of our target clients across several different markets, uh, you know, our three kind of different revenue uh, streams. And so we had a really clear on what, what each segment wanted or didn't want. And we were then able to talk with conviction when we were fundraising because uh, you know, an investor would push back on a point and we could say, oh, hey, that's interesting because we've had 50 user interviews and this is the theme that has emerged there. And you can back up your claims with data. And I think inevitably founders are um, idealistic in many ways. And I think that data, you know, it really changed the way that we approached one part of the market, you know, to, which we otherwise would have got completely wrong. Um, so I think, you know, make sure the deck is is super clear and tells a story and that it's enjoyable to read then make sure that you know you have the data to back up your points. Um, and then I think approaching it like a sales process is good. And I've noticed a bit of a discrepancy between how angel investors on LinkedIn or some angel investors on LinkedIn talk about this versus founders. Because if you're a founder with a network, obviously the best way of getting started is to reach out to a few people who are going to pass your you know, bullet point summary and your deck onto angels that they know. Um, but if you haven't got a network, then how do you get in front of those people? Because you need to reach out to angels cold. You're going to maybe speak to accelerators who are going to want part of your company. You know, there are way fewer options open to you. And I've noticed a few angel investors who have angel investor on their LinkedIn as a title complain about receiving cold pitch decks from, <laughs> from clients, which I've, I've found fair enough if, you, if you're not an angel investor or you're, you're not publicizing that you're an angel investor. But I think... You know, you can't you can't have that on your LinkedIn and then complain when people send you angel investments. Um, so I reached out. I didn't actually have a huge network. Um, I had a lot of people that I knew who worked in finance who were able to put, you know, who wanted to put money in, uh, which was very flattering. But it was a few core angel investors and people that I'd um, I had a relationship with uh, previously or ex an existing relationship with who sent it on to a few friends. One of them would invest and then. You know, they would send it on to a few more friends. So I think that that's the way of doing it. If you that's the way to do it, if you can. But people often say outreach doesn't work. Cold outreach doesn't work. And we had a few tickets from, you know, from reaching out cold. And then the final point. Sorry, this answer is dragged. Uh, the final the final point that um, I really found and completely ignored when I was fundraising was raising uh, starting with the easy quote unquote conversation. So start with individual angels. Don't start by going to funds or, you know, even if they're like SEIS or early stage funds, you know, start by going to the easy conversations, working out what's resonating about your pitch and what's not. And I think because my background was in sales and, you know, I'm from a kind of commercial background, I thought, ah, you know, I'll be fine. And I wasn't fine. You know, the first few conversations I had with funds absolutely crashed and burned. So I was humbled very quickly by that. I, I can't imagine because uh, that's the same background. Background I have is also of sales, and you always walk in thinking, "I got this." But in reality, once you start you know, tossing a few curveballs, that you know, yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe I don't. <laughs> maybe I need to go back to the drawing room yeah. and kind of, uh, make a better plan. So I, yeah, that happens <laughs> quite quite often. Would you say that it is hard overall to fundraise, right? Because this this is your first startup, right? Yeah. So w do you think the whole process was is is hard? Or it's kind of, you kind of make your way across it. So we improvise it along the way. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because now I've got the benefit of hindsight. You know, I, I, I was leaning towards saying, oh, it's not just stay determined. But that's exactly what, when you're listening to a, 
you know, a multi-millionaire successful business person on a podcast or whatever, which I'm not, by the way, I'm just using that as an example. And they say, oh, you know, anyone can do it. It's just grit. Well, it's easy for them to say because they've already done it. But if I put myself in the shoes, uh, in my shoes, when I was fundraising, it, there were so many highs and lows. And those, those lows are really amplified by the fact it's your idea, it's your baby, you're the only one carrying it. And I had to constantly remind myself that these were people who were objectively trying to assess a business opportunity. But because at the pre-seed pre -seed level, you know, there's some validation there, but not much, yeah. it ultimately comes down to their belief in like the, t the founding team and the founder. So it's very easy to take things personally if someone decides to pass on an opportunity. And I think that's, um, that's the hard bit. I think there's a lot of capital out there chasing too few opportunities, good opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as a founder, you, you, you go on an emotional roller coaster to a degree especially when you're raising your first round. I, 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 I will be approaching our seed round very differently um, if we choose to raise one. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry. Just, on that note, I was just about to ask you, how do you deal with that, with that low, right? Because it's going to yeah. happen, right? You're going to get home or, or finish a, you know, a Skype call, or no one just Skype, a video call with someone and just going to yeah. feel absolutely horrible. So how, how do you manage that? How do you get back on, on your feet after... Uh, you know, after yeah. being tossed the biggest curve ball in your life. So how do you Yeah. So um, a, a good question. You know, the, the thing that I felt very lucky, uh, you know, as a solo founder um, to have was uh, a load of mentors who are not necessarily invested in the business, but, but were personally invested in me um, and thought it was a good concept, thought I was the person to do it and who were willing to offer advice um, and almost basically reassurance that, that, this was the path to go, that this is what we should be doing, that we had to just keep persevering. As I said, I never, you know, for a moment thought that um, we wouldn't be able to, to fundraise or we, or this concept was, was one that I shouldn't be working on, mm -hmm. but it, it, it certainly can be difficult to, you know, fa well, face rejection. Um, and especially if you have a few does in yeah. a row, you know, I, I ended up just turning, there was one week where, uh, you know, the, the, the big backer that we were talking to said no. And then a variety of other smaller ones did. And I was like, oh, this is hell week for me. Um, but you just hard. have to, you, you know, you, you do have to persevere. And I think ultimately, if you don't back your idea and the, the, this is where market research is so important because with, without, if I hadn't done that market research, I wonder whether I would have persevered to the same degree that I had, because that would have just been on basically gut feel. And, oh, this is a problem I think exists, as opposed to this is a problem that I know exists for this many people who are going to be my first customers or my first investors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it's a, a good question. But I think, yeah, that, that conviction in your idea and then having people to talk to about it to kind of reassure you you're on the right path is, is, is was at least very important for me. I, I can't speak for everyone, but. Um, so now that we have, you know, we kind of went through what the company does, your own journey as an entrepreneur. Hmm. For people listening in and they're just getting started, what would you tell them? You know what? Just go this way. Don't go the, the, that other way or, or take this little, you know, motto or something. What yeah. was that one piece of advice you would give someone? Yeah. I think when I look back on my biggest regrets to where we are now, my major regret is that I didn't get started years before I did. Um, <laughs> I, I had this concept uh, from about 2020 onwards and I had a suspicion so that gut feel that I was talking about that this problem existed but I didn't start validating it until you know well the end of 2022 really uh, and I, I think my like my my advice and for some reason I found it very hard to to see it myself when I was when I was going through it but it's not like this nebulous fog of things to do there are a series of steps that it takes to you know, come up with a, a concept to market test that concept, to uh, take that concept to investors, to fundraise, to get your first customers, to build out a platform, you know, all the way to where we are now, um, where we're starting to look at, right, okay, you know, what's the, you know, how can we sort our unit economics out? You know, what do they look like? The, those kind of um, scale up questions. And I think it's, it's important that people remember that. And if they don't take that first step, which for me was, was validating an idea that I had, you know, you need to have an idea, but sometimes ideas just come from talking to other people about their problems. Then you've got no right to complain that you're not where you want to be. And I spent, 
you know, seven years of my career, really, uh, working jobs that were, that, you know, were great and, and um, were enjoyable, but I knew ultimately were not me and not where I wanted to end up longer term. Uh, so I think that, again, at the risk of sounding like a, a life coach, because I don't mean to at all, but like that willingness to just to take the first step and then to, you know, because if you try and if you try and do too much, and this is when I first started fundraising as well, I kept reminding myself of this. Like if I look too far ahead, I would get, get freak out and get motivated, demotivated because I couldn't see how, you know, how do you build a hundred million pound company or dollar company? Uh, you know, how can you hit these milestones? How can we get these people on board? And and those are completely the wrong questions to ask. You know, it is a series of baby steps, but you just have to constantly make sure uh, that you're doing something every day that's going to move you forwards. Um, otherwise, you're going to remain in the same place where you were and where ultimately I did at different, at different companies for much longer than I would have liked to, I think, if I was to, you know, put together a perfect life plan or whatever. There was a good book on, on uh, small incremental changes. I think it's called 1%. Mm. And it's from one of the coaches, and I could be completely wrong here, that helped uh, Team GB win so many gold medals on mm. the Olympics in London in 2012. And it's just about improving that 1%. And you keep on improving 1% and then an extra 1%. And as you add all these 1% up, you actually improve quite a lot. Mm. Instead of just trying, because a lot of people try to focus, how can I improve 20% of my life? Well, you can't, but no. you can improve 1%. So yeah. just wake up, I don't know, half an hour earlier and go to the gym, something. And that's that that thing does add up after a while. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's quite impactful. Um, I was just wondering, what's what's next for your company? I mean, are you guys raising? Uh, what's the next? Do you want to shout out to investors? Hey, guys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> company, uh, Maybe. So, so it's, a, it's an interesting one because um, we are cash flow positive, which is great. So we're in a position where we don't need to raise. But ultimately, we believe there's an opportunity here to become the go-to solution for wine investment, um, you know, almost synonymous with wine investment in the same way that um, Vanguard is synonymous with index funds. You know, when you think about, oh, where am I going to get my S&P 500 tracker? You think, oh, Vanguard, you know, straight away. At least if you work in, if you're a huge nerd that works in finance, like that's what you think. I'm sure most normal people don't immediately associate the two. Um, and I think to do that, it would probably be sensible to um, to, to raise more capital in some, in some shape or form. Um, we're seeing a lot of interest, which is really encouraging. Uh, I think largely because we are building in public. So, you know, I hope I haven't come across as overly candid uh, in this podcast so far, but, um, you know, I want to build a very transparent, authentic business because I think that resonates with people in this day and age. And I have been doing that publicly on LinkedIn. Um, you know, our chief commercial officer, Johnny Keeling, uh, has been doing that publicly on LinkedIn. Um, and we've been telling our story like as we've been building in real time. And I think people have been able to see the progress that we're, we're making. And as a result, you know, I, I would hope that we are in a, a good position. Maybe not now. I, th I think there's a few milestones that I would like to like to hit first. And actually a few assumptions still left to prove, yeah. you know, before running into just raising a seed round um, for no reason. But then I suspect we will be raising it at some point. Um, Okay, interesting. Yeah. Let me know because <laughs> it's all. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, if people want to reach out to you, uh, taking on a, a lot of what we're talking about, um, how can they do so? Sure. So, you can drop me an email. I'm Callum, that's C A W -L, L U M, at winify.co. Or I'm on LinkedIn um, pretty much every day. So, I maybe it was best to put my LinkedIn handle in the description, but I'm Callum McCock on LinkedIn. I have, I'm not under a pseudonym. And yeah, I love to receive messages on both platforms. So if anyone wants to reach out, uh, even just to have a chat and find out a little bit more about what we're doing, you know, please feel free. We're always interested in meeting new people. Sounds good. Callum, thank you so much for your time. It's been absolutely Thank you, pleasure. Ricardo. No, real pleasure to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Just click stop.